Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning. Um, <clears throat> as Tim said, I'm going to talk with you about uh, freshwater fishes of Long Island. What are they and where do they come from? Um, and as Tim said, <laughs> the, the island was formed by glaciers. It's, we're, we're on an island. Um, we're surrounded by uh, salt water, um, but we have substantial freshwater resources here on the island. Uh, we have over 500 lakes and ponds, uh, the largest of which uh, Lake Ronkonkoma is 240 acres. Uh, we have more than 30 miles of streams, um, 44 species of fish representing 18 families um, in our ponds, lakes, and streams. Uh, 36 of those species have self-maintaining populations. <clears throat> so where did Long Island's freshwater fishes come from? Um, you can see on the, the right side of this pie graph, a lot of them came from quite a ways away. Uh, we have two species from South America, four from Asia, two from Europe, uh, three that are native to the United States but not New York, and then eight that are native to New York but not Long Island. And then we do have 25 species that, that are native, and I have native in quotation marks because not everybody agrees with what's native. Um, I'm using that to mean a species that got here on its own, um, but a lot of these species had help as well. <clears throat> um, so how did the, the fish get here? Um, <clears throat> you hear a lot about fish getting to places where they're not supposed to be via ballast water, and that's one concern we don't have on Long Island because we don't have much commercial shipping coming into our fresh water. Um, we did, do have two species that could have gotten here from um, live food fish release, um, three species that are probably from bait bucket releases, uh, four species from aquarium release, um, one species each for mosquito control and one for vegetation control. And then there were probably about 17 species that were stocked by private individuals um, for mostly for sport fishing. Uh, some were, of those were approved, uh, most were not. Um, and then the government. Um, <clears throat> New York State has been stocking fish since the late 19th century and has continued to stock fish through the present day. Uh, roughly 35 species have been stocked by the government on Long Island. Uh, the most prolific period of stocking for, was from the 1920s through the 1950s. Um, if you're good at math and you did some counting, you figured that's a lot more species than the ones I talked about. There are two reasons for that. One is there's a lot of overlap. Most of the species stocked by private individuals have also been stocked by the government. And also, a lot of the species that have been stocked did not uh, take and are no longer found on Long Island. <clears throat> so we have met the enemy, and he is us. Uh, so let's start with the species that people brought here. Um, two species from South America, the Paku and the Piranha. Um, <clears throat> both of these species have been caught by anglers on Long Island. Um, the most common place where they get caught is Lake Ronkonkoma. They're not winter hardy, so they don't maintain populations, um, but people continue to get them and put them in their aquaria and they get too big and they try and find a place to put them and sometimes it's in our water bodies. Um, piranha are regulated by uh, New York State. You're not allowed to possess them without a permit and we don't issue permits to private individuals but that doesn't mean that private individuals don't get them. Uh, Paku are generally not regulated. Um, you can buy them very small in a pet shop and they get very large. Um, so they're not very good aquarium species, but they uh, do occasionally get into our water bodies. And because they look so much like piranha, a lot of times when an angler catches one, he thinks he's got a piranha. <clears throat> um, Asian species, the goldfish. Everybody knows about goldfish. Uh, their distribution on Long Island is scattered. We have a few reproducing populations, but not a lot. That was probably the first exotic species stocked in New York. There are records of them being released in the mid-19th century. 
Um, it's primarily aquarium releases. And, and one thing that always makes me cringe is when I go to a local uh, fair or carnival and they have the carnival game where you, the kids can throw a ball in a cup and they win a goldfish. Now those goldfish, most of them probably die, but I bet a lot of them end up in our local water bodies. It's not too uncommon for us to catch a five or six pound goldfish when we're out doing our surveying. Um, another Asian species is the uh, grass carp. Um, New York State approved the stocking of sterile triploid grass carp for vegetation control beginning in the um, late 1980s. Um, to date, we have no known natural reproduction of this species in, in uh, New York or on Long Island. Um, a more recent arrival is the northern snakehead. Um, this species is established, has a breeding population in uh, Flushing Meadow Park, uh, Willow and Meadow, Meadow Ponds. Um, New York State regulates this. If you catch it, you have to kill it. You have to keep it. Uh, you're not allowed to possess it alive. Um, <clears throat> it was almost certainly a live food fish release. It's very popular in the uh, Asian food markets. And the fourth Asian species is another relatively recent introduction, the Oriental weatherfish. It has a population established in the Ronkonkoma Swamp, just north of Lake Ronkonkoma. Um, it was almost certainly an aquarium release, but I have read that somewhere, some areas it's been stocked as a food fish as well, although it doesn't get very large. Uh, European species, the uh, probably one of the most reviled species um, exotic species in freshwater at least is the common carp. Um, but it was distributed widely by the US government in the late, teen, late 19th century. Uh, the US Fish Commission imported common carp from Ger Germany in 1877. For the next two decades, the agency began stocking and distributing the fish as a food fish throughout most of the United States and its territories. They would uh, put the fish in tanks on trains, and when the train crossed the stream, they dropped the fish over. Um, so carp are, are common in most Long Island waters. Um, they're here, and they're going to stay. Um, from the most, one of the most reviled species to one of the most revered species, or other European species, is the brown trout. It was first stocked in New York in 1883. It was documented in Cold Spring Harbor in 1894. Um, it's been stocked extensively on Long Island. In fact, my agency continues to stock it. We stock about 18,000 a year. Um, the only documented natural reproduction of brown trout on Long Island is in the Kanekwat River. <clears throat> um, some native species, native to the United States, but not New York. Um, the rainbow trout, which is a Pacific Coast species. Um, the DEC stocks rainbow trout extensively. We stock about 14,000 on Long Island annually. Um, they have been stocked for a long time. But to date, we have not documented any natural reproduction of rainbow trout on Long Island. Um, another species that's been stocked by uh, government, um, the western mosquito fish. Uh, was stocked extensively by counties for mosquito control, and there are some existing populations on the island. <clears throat> a couple of species that have very limited distribution on Long Island, they're not native to Long Island. Um, the green sunfish is not native to New York. It first showed up in New York at the beginning of the 20th century and has been expanding its range. And we've documented one population on Long Island in Santapog Creek in Babylon. Um, to my knowledge, it's never been stocked by New York State. Uh, we don't know how it got there. Um, <clears throat> the other species, this one's native to New York, but not Long Island, is the rock bass. Um, it was stocked by New York State in the 20s and 30s. Um, <clears throat> so far, we've only documented one population on Long Island. Um, and that's in the Little River, Sweezy Pond, Wildwood Lake system in Southampton. A <clears throat> um, couple other New York natives that have been stocked on Long Island. Uh, the channel catfish, uh, it's not currently stocked. It does occasionally show up in bait shipments though, so it, 
every now and again you'll get a fish in there. Um, and every now and again we'll get a report from an angler of a large channel catfish getting caught. Um, but to our knowledge there are no naturally reproducing populations. Uh, likewise with the black bullhead, um, it was stocked as part of an urban fishing program by the uh, DEC in the 1970s and the current state record, New York state record for black bullhead is from Mill Pond in Wanta. Um, but um, there are no known naturally reproducing populations um, on Long Island. Um, two other New York natives that have been stocked on Long Island, the walleye, uh, which was stocked uh, extensively by New York State in the 20s and 30s. Um, DEC resumed stocking walleye on Long Island in the 1990s uh, with stockings in Fort Pond and Lake Ronkonkoma and we continue with annual stockings of walleye in both of those waters. Uh, there's no natural reproduction in either pond. Um, they are uh, helping us control some overabundant panfish and they're providing a uh, popular uh, recreational fishery, but they are not reproducing on their own. Uh, smallmouth bass were stocked extensively in New York um, State from the 1920s to the 1960s. Um, there are naturally reproducing populations in Lake Ronkonkoma and Fort Pond. Um, we used to have a smallmouth bass population in Fresh Pond on Shelter Island but it was supplanted by um, largemouth bass in the uh, 90s and early 2000s. There's rumors that there are smallmouth bass in Lake Success as well. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> some uh, New York State natives that have been fully naturalized to Long Island, uh, the largemouth bass, uh, the bluegill, and the black crappie. Um, all three species were stocked extensively. Good morning, everyone. We are, uh, for folks out in the lobby, if you want to make your way into the uh, auditorium, we're going to get started. Um, my name is Tim Green. I'm the, uh, compliant, uh, the environmental compliance uh, manager for the uh, laboratory. Uh, I have a staff of about five, six people that uh, we work uh, with a lot of other people to to make sure that the laboratory stays in compliance with all of the environmental laws. Yes, uh, that, uh, that's, that'll be my comment, yes. So <laughs> you said it, I said yes. <laughs> um, we uh, welcome you to Brookhaven National Laboratory for I believe this is the fourth uh, Long Island Natural History Conference, maybe five, I'm not counting. Uh, it get, we got confused after the second year and when we moved it uh, from the fall to the spring. Um, but it is the 2017 uh, Lo Long Island Natural History Conference. We have a, a lot of great talks over the next two days uh, that will entertain you and enlighten you about uh, the natural history of Long Island. Uh, several years ago, a group of us got together and felt that uh, this would be a good venue to really educate people about Long Island and what we have here. It's a very rich and diverse uh, habitat for wildlife and uh, both on the land and in the water. Um, we are, we're actually going to get some of that hard, hard uh, natural history and talk about some geology this year. Um, so we're looking forward to learning a little bit about the geology of the island as well. So there are a couple of uh, uh, housekeeping items that I uh, need to inform you are. Uh, one of our key principles here at the laboratory is safety. Uh, we want you to go home in the same or better condition uh, as you got here. Uh, so the better condition is new knowledge in your head. Um, and so as you're walking around the laboratory, uh, please pay attention to where you're walking and uh, would appreciate you not texting and walking and checking your phone while you are walking uh, because that's how we found over the years uh, that people get injured because they're not paying attention to what the next step. Um, we, uh, the speed limit on site is 30 miles an hour unless otherwise posted. And uh, that otherwise posting is going out the front gate. It is 20 miles an hour. Our police force will stop you and will ticket you. Uh, 
stop signs, we ask you to actually stop at the stop signs. Uh, I know we're, we all live in New York and most of the time we just kind of cruise to that uh, little eight-sided eight uh, sign and slow down and go, oh, there's nobody coming and we keep going. We expect you to come to a full and complete stop at stop signs. Um, restrooms, uh, restrooms for in the building, if you go out the uh, doors into the um, lobby, they are to the uh, right. If you just keep bearing right, there's uh, both men's and women's restrooms and the water fountain there. If those are occupied or being cleaned, there is another set of restrooms. If you go down the stairs towards Berkner B, where our poster session and the food is, uh, just kind of bear le to the left and you'll see another set of restrooms uh, right as you get to the, the glass, uh, the Barra store there. Uh, so, you know, take advantage of those as you need them. Uh, if for some reason the fire alarms go off, uh, we will ask you to exit the building as expeditiously as possible. Um, there are exits on uh, up front, on the sides, and in the back. And then we ask that you meet in the parking lot so that we can account for everybody. We, I have never, in 18 years of being here and doing hosting conferences, it has never happened. So I might have just jinxed it. <laughs> um, so, so we are looking forward uh, to this conference and uh, hope for your enjoyment and, and learning a lot. Our first speaker today um, is John Tanner Credding. He uh, works a lot with horseshoe crabs, and he is uh, with the Department of Biology, Chemistry, and Environmental Studies, and the, and the director of CIRCOM at Malloy College. And his uh, talk today, let me get out of this and get into his, uh, is on horseshoe crabs, uh, IUCN red listing, and world heritage species designation for a global conservation icon in dire straits. John, if you'll come up, I'll get you loaded. You are set. If you need me, I will be down front and I'll okay. kind of give you the, when you get close to 10 minutes, I'll be okay. Thank you, Tim. Can uh, everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to ask you uh, um, to do something for me before I get started. Uh, or I'd like you to write these numbers down, if you can. Between 2009 and 2015, the total number of medical prescriptions written, dispersed in the United States was 3.95 billion. The total global number of surgeries estimated in, 19, in 2004 numbers worldwide is 235 million surgeries, hospital surgeries. <clears throat> the pharmaceutical quality and quantity control aspect, monitoring the proper product quality and pro in uh, large quantities, is a $350 million industry, just for one chemical that I'll be talking to you about today. And just in diabetes drug testing, injectable insulin, 25.8 million people have to deal with the bacteriological quality of injectable drugs just for diabetes uh, controlled. So those numbers, if you can just keep them in mind, I think they'll be more important or more prevalent in the, in the, the presentation here. This uh, presentation is not about dinosaurs. However, a, a species, a group, actually only four particular species of an individual organism, an invertebrate, uh, which has been described as not only a seminal species in the protection of certain habitats and its importance ecologically and as a paleo survivor, but as a sentinel species, one telling us something about the quality of the environment that we're associated with or the impacts that humans have on environments is probably more important and has been on Earth longer than the entire span of time, geological time, that dinosaurs roamed the Earth. As a matter of fact, 
this particular group of organisms, horseshoe crabs, probably walked below the legs of brontosauruses in their time period. Uh, and for 150 million years, these organisms predominated the landscape of Earth. And, but just recently, oops, sorry, dating back to just at the cusp of the Cambrian, 455 million years, paleolimuli has been identified, along with an assemblage of invertebrates that predominated the early paleo oceans, organisms that today we look at them for not only their fossil importance in looking at Earth history, New York State's uh, state fossil is Eurypterids, the organisms that you see right here. These guys, all right? So we have a, a great appreciation of these uh, animals primarily because of their paleo survival. Uh, much discussion today about the idea of extinction events, the sixth <coughs> extinction uh, on the press, in the press, in, in publications. But at the time that these organisms survived or existed in, in the early oceans, these are the only living, as they say, fossils today. These, they've survived five mass extinction events, and they're still with us. So just from their paleo history, these organisms have earned a protection. They should have been protected just for that, for the study of their survivability. Uh, group the arthropods on the cusp of crustaceans, chelicerates, organisms that have legs that surround their mouths are a unique group of organisms, all right? Mostly found uh, and uh, basically related to uh, scorpions and um, to other types of insects that are associated with their uh, ability to feed, their ability to uh, get oxygen, and there's a relationship also with crustaceans. Though the crustacean society has embraced horseshoe crabs only recently, uh, there's still a debate associated with that, but the important thing is that invertebrate species, for all intents and purposes, unless you see them during their breeding times, most people don't see them. There's attention to horseshoe crabs only in the time that they're coming mating because they're coming up onto the shore and they're kind of strange looking or alien looking, so there's a, a bit of attention. But there's a more important aspect to them in the ecological, and I hope that will come out um, this morning. Again. Um, based upon their survivability, they outlived an organism that existed on the planet much longer, even longer than, than the dinosaurs were existing here, the trilobites. So there's, a, a, again, a connection to paleo history. And the physiology is some of the portions associated with that. Um, I won't go into the details here, but certainly from the standpoint of a, a good body plan, a good opportunity reproductive plan, all of these types of things have allowed for its survivability and contribute to the attention we give to them because associated with their survival, uh, there's a, a certain practical use of these organisms and we'll talk about that, or I'll talk about that in a moment. So again, dated back to Paleolimuli, this is the oldest um, Mesolimnius, 455 million years ago. And this is in the fossil record. But these animals have a, a torturous history. Um, they were used for fertilizer for many years. Um, uh, and when there was no real discussion about their populations, something like four million in this particular uh, year collected just for fertilizer. So the, the replacement with chemical fertilizers, petroleum fertilizer, um, did something in a positive uh, vein and protected these animals. They're, they're not really used for fertilizer anymore, but they are collected for uh, consumption, and we'll talk about that in a moment. We also have a very unique habitat for these organisms, one that you all, uh, coming to a, an association and a presentation like this today, are, are well aware of, this fragile edge 
we call our barrier islands and barrier beaches. Uh, this is uh, basically the bite, New York bite apex, the bite uh, area, a uh, portion that's been studied. New York State has a very unique um, category in, in all of the states in the National Estuarine Program, has four major estuarine programs uh, sponsored by EPA. Uh, the only one that's not sponsored by EPA is the South Shore Estuarine Reserve, which is under the New York State Department of State. But the idea of estuaries, uh, the most productive ecosystems on the planet that uh, we, are know, we know of, and the nursery grounds for hosts of organisms, and a place in which the, they are transitional places between the terrestrial environment and, and the, the near ocean and the ocean environment, ecotones. And ecologists understand ecotones as being very dynamic, very challenging environmental conditions. So just understanding their resiliency or their ability to survive even in those particular environments is pretty important. And this particular environment here along the coastlines, as you can, this is uh, it's a very poor photo, but it's an old one. Um, the idea of development along the shore. Every man, woman, and child in the United States, all of you will spend at least 10 days minimum, 10 days a year in some type of coastal activity. Two thirds of the world's population lives within an, within an hour's drive uh, of, the, of the coastline, the shoreline. Some of the, in the last decade, in the last two decades, the, the um, most cataclysmic um, uh, events that have taken place have been coastal issues from Fukushima in Japan uh, to uh, Katrina and, uh, and Sandy. All types of events that take place, large-scale meteorological events are played out and geotechnical events are played out along the coastline. So not only this dynamic habitat is important um, just for its ecological significance, but it's, it's the dramatic influence the face to more and more people and more and more infrastructure and more and more development that is um, is critical and impacting these particular habitats. Uh, just remember, if you, have, if you haven't forgotten, uh, or if you have forgotten, $60 billion just for Sandy alone went in for infrastructure in New York State, $60 billion. So when we talk, start talking about, wouldn't that be wonderful if that kind of money was available to, for research and scientific investigations to talk about, or any type of research, cancer research at a minimum. The coastline um, is still a very dynamic place, um, psychologically, emotionally, but ecologically as an ecotone. And it's this Spartina marsh, coastal intertidal marshes that are critical habitats. And so we have these very important places that have to be protected, and we can see little remnant uh, indications of, of, the, of horseshoe crabs coming ashore, even if you don't uh, know them. But these types of habitats are dwindling. They're impacted by that infrastructure development, by the, the sheer population, human population, coming closer and closer to the shoreline. We can find their nesting habitat, um, nesting activities, rather, in their habitat. We can track them through um, up into a point where there's some obstacle, some kind of jetty, some kind of physical structure, some kind of new condominium development, parking lot, you name it, airport, runway, whatever might be proposed taking place to support that burgeoning population has an impact, but it's, the impact has to be not, not just an acute one, it's a chronic uh, contribution to their entire biology and and conservation. Uh, if an animal can't get to a breeding site because they have to climb over rock jetties, the probability will be that they won't get there. So we need to have more attention to these animals along the coastline. Their biology is, uh, is still being studied, the conservation. Uh, in the abstract submitted for today, I gave this kind of uh, abridged history in the last uh, decade. Uh, we started with the first International Conference on Horseshoe Crab Biology and Conservation in 2007 in New York, and in 2009 it was published. In 2011, we did the first Asian Horseshoe Crab Conference uh, in Hong Kong University, uh, at, at City University in Hong Kong. And then we um, worked on a project just in 2015 for the second conference because more and more Asian habitat sites have been identified, and it is, this entire process began with attention to the ice 
CU, um, IUCN, International Union of Conservation of Nature, uh, designation of species as red listed. Red listing species is the international uh, endangered species uh, uh, um, listing. Um, Limulus polyphemus has just been listed, red listed. The other three species I'll talk to you about have not, but it leads to their biology and to the knowledge base uh, about these animals. More than likely, the attention to these animals is this single event during their breeding season, the, the kind of the wow factor coming onto the shoreline, seeing quite a few of these coming into Delaware Bay, for example, which is the epicenter on the east coast of the United States for horseshoe crabs. Those uh, particular sites now called the Carl Schuster Preserve, uh, protected basically for, for um, uh, harvesting. Uh, these animals are, are protected and they're seeing the numbers stabilize and increasing in the Delaware Bay portion of the east coast of the United States. Um, the, the males generally come ashore uh, first, females follow about, uh, the animals, um, cluster in marshes. If you've ever had a chance to go to Delaware Bay or uh, Prime Hook um, Beach, uh, Slaughter Beach in Delaware, uh, along the Maryland coast, it's an amazing experience. You should do that, uh, certainly uh, beginning in May, early in June. High tide, full moon, their relationship to lunar cycles and to luminosity is very important. A Nobel Prize was won in studying the eyes of horseshoe crabs. So there's a tremendous scientific history here, and as much as we've identified and as much as we know, we know very little about these animals, as, uh, primarily because of their decline um, throughout the world. And I'll show you in a minute, but this is on Delaware Bay. Um, the other major part of, uh, here's a few of the animals coming ashore, is uh, the fact that this mating activity is a, a unique opportunity for, um, if you wanted to take a look at the idea of genetic diversity and the idea of impacts on populations in general, um, th this is uh, called amplexus, when the male, um, its physiology is, is such that it attaches to the female. You can tell how long the females uh, have been involved with this uh, it's a reproductive groove that's associated with here when they're sexually mature. Um, each female will put between 80 and 100,000 eggs in a single nesting season. They usually have four or five nesting periods. Uh, a single male will, will come ashore to, um, to um, inseminate, fertilize the, the, the eggs left in the sediment. Um, but there will be other um, males that will come about. They're called satellite males, so, and they'll all be uh, fertilizing these eggs along the coast. And um, because of that, here's a good picture of that, uh, this genetic diversity is, is, is a part of probably uh, attributable to its uh, paleo survival. So it's a portion that is still being studied um, to this day. Uh, we're actually uh, doing work associated with acid um, ocean acidification and the impacts on pH changes in estuarine environments and whether or not uh, juveniles and larvae, uh, larvae of the animal are impacted. They are invertebrates, so from the standpoint of their, their growth and maturation is, um, is associated with molting. Uh, the molting process is still fascinating to me, and here the, the females go through 17 molts, um, the males 16 molts. This is over a nine, 10 to uh, an 11 year period. Uh, in that time period, uh, the, most of the molts take place within the first uh, year or two. Uh, they're called instars. Uh, there's at least 10 instars. We've been able to, in our laboratory, uh, which we do captive breeding for these animals, uh, have gotten them up to about the 10th instar. We have a few animals that are several years old. But globally, this has been a problem, a concern about captive breeding this particular invertebrate. And I'll talk to you about why that is in a moment. Um, so the animals come ashore, high tide, full moon. Um, there's a whole bunch of uh, organisms that are attached, encrusting interiorly, exteriorly, these um, all over the, the um, prosoma of the animal. You know, here, you, you slipper shells, all types of organisms that are attached to the, um, the, um, the carapace. And um, here's just a single nest uh, of eggs that are produced the, in... in in nature, about 21 days or so gestation uh, from the point so they get to their trilobite larvae, 
you can see their eyes, you can see the, all of the types of things, and certainly their tail has started to come in as they move into juvenile stage after several weeks. Uh, they're in, they, have a, a, they use up their particular um, uh, yolk in, within their eggs. There's a whole bunch of groups that are associated with monitoring for eggs in sediments. Uh, green sand um, uh, is, and eggs are one of the uh, important programs. But again, it's history to its distribution connected to its paleo history. They're only found on the east sides of, of continents. Um, uh, Limulus polyphemus, this is its range here. Down, you can actually put a flag in the beach right outside of Tallahassee in Florida. You won't find them breeding uh, west of that. And in the Yucatan, right? Same thing in the Yucatan at the tip of the Yucatan Peninsula. In the, in the Asian species, three species, two Tachyplaeus, one uh, Carcinoscorpius. These are found in the Bay of Bengal, all the way to the tip, one island in the tip of Japan, which has been reduced down to like two or three uh, pairs coming ashore uh, each year. And along the China, uh, the China coast, uh, through to Hong Kong here, and Taiwan. And in Taiwan, they're called the marriage crabs. Every wedding gets together because they, that's what they do. And they, they paint the carapaces, to, so there's a, a social connection uh, to horseshoe crabs in Taiwan. Uh, in southern Taiwan is the world's largest aquarium. They have a whole wing where they captive breed horseshoe crabs, and they can't get them past 10 instar as well. But I'll show you some of the problems there. And then in this portion of Asia, and we know nothing about the number, very little about the animals in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in Indonesia. But there are some facts that I'll be bringing to you in a moment. This portion of the world is where the major attention for IUCN and why that is true, because all three of those species are really in trouble, in dire straits. The numbers are dwindling, um, and yet there are 7,000 islands in the Philippines, and not a single one of those islands has been explored for horseshoe crab populations. Another part of this, uh, of this organism's uh, existence is, is its ecological um, synchrony to migratory birds. Uh, if you're an ornithologist or a bird, uh, a biologist interested in birds, you know that uh, they're linked to red knots, ruddy turnstones, and other coastal birds, migratory birds that come from as far away as Terra del Fuego up into Canada, into breeding portions into Alaska. Here are some laughing gulls. Birds all along the coastline, tens of millions of birds feeding on the eggs as a protein source. Endangered species, piping plovers, all types of, of organisms along the shoreline synchronized to the migration of horseshoe crabs. And so you have this paleo survivability, you have this ecological conservation uh, contribution in the migratory protection of, of other species, a multi-species concept. And, um, and then just the, their idea of being substrate for a host of invertebrates, fouling organisms, which, again, most people don't worry about unless they're scraping them off a boat or something. But the important part of this is that they are, have an ecological niche. And just a few quick showing you some of those. Again, the satellite males. The animals are collected um, at Malloy College. We have uh, an inventory each year. We look for volunteers. Any volunteers? All right. We have an opportunity to measure across the carapace, across their eyes, um, and sometimes they're labeled, tagged. So there's a bunch of tagging programs. We don't necessarily do that, but there are opportunities for, for doing that. And they're constantly in any dredges or any types of uh, um, work that's being done in estuaries in the sediment. I have uh, I worked for the National Park Service for 24 years, uh, some 20 years ago, and um, we did some underwater photography of horseshoe crabs coming into New York Harbor. And as they come in, they, they move into the Rockaway Inlet, as the sites we had, and they, like cattle, they graze along uh, mussel beds into the estuary, into the marsh. And you don't see them until they obviously come on shore, but if you're out trolling, doing any trolling, you will, you will see them. Again, they're compound eyes, 
very important. They have a host of 10 other what are called ocelli or primitive eyes like in scallops. And then the third important part of their uh, seminal importance is the fact that they have a practical application to your and my health. Um, their blood is blue, it's copper based, it has a unique characteristic in its ability to um, be spun down to um, get the um, amoebocytes. Uh, it's collected, 600,000 animals worldwide are collected each year and bled to produce a chemical in North America called Limulus amoebocyte lysate, LAL. Every hospital, every surgery, every one of those injectable drugs that I mentioned to you as, as bits of information have had LAL used to determine gram-negative bacteria, which is very important. The endotoxin aspect of gram-negative bacteria is that it creates sepsis if it gets into your respiratory system or circulatory system. So the practical factor of $350 million as an industry is very important. Um, there's a debate today that is still going on about having synthetic LAL, so we wouldn't have to depend on this. Millions of dollars has been spent in laboratories to determine this, uh, but there are problems at FDA and a host of other, um, what I call political with small p, concerns. But the original test was the rabbit test, endotoxin uh, test for rabbits, and they were injected and had to wait 48 hours. There was a long time frame. So your health protection, the quality control and quality assurance of your health is improved through the use of the blood of horseshoe crabs. That alone should be enough to protect them uh, for what they're being used in, in other capacities. Um, this is just a...